Good morning. Good morning. We are glad to see you all here this morning. I welcome you, Jamie Alexander, one of the pastors. It's my privilege to welcome you and let you in on the knowledge that we are concluding in the sermon series called Searching for Significance. We've been looking at persons in the family line of Jesus based on Matthew, the first chapter. So as we gather here today, we're, we'll conclude our sermon series by looking at the life of Abraham. So we're glad that you're here to join with us in this day. I invite you to join me now. We want to pray and de dedicate our time to the Lord and invite the Lord's presence to come and, and to bless us. So we join me in prayer. Lord, we're honored to be in your house today. And as we gather in your name, we gather in your love. We ask you to come and rest upon us to draw us close to you so that we may experience you and in the depth of your love and in the truth of your knowledge. For in you, Lord, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and in you we come. We ask you to bathe us in the anointing of your Holy Spirit. In the wonderful name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And together we say,
Wednesday evening. And it would have been this Wednesday night, except for Ash Wednesday. And so it's going to be February 20th, a week later. We hope that many of you that would like to go or are planning to go uh, have your reservations. And if you need to change or make a reservation, call Alan Kaplan. His number is listed here in the bulletin. And he will be more than happy to take your information. So with that, we'll just praise God. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you all here and uh, worship with us today. If you're able, please stand and join us in singing. We're going to start with our first song, which is Bridge Over Troubled Water.
everybody's greeting one another. If the little ones have come down, I've asked the uh, youth to come down today also. They are not happy, but they're coming. Some of them are taller than me. Come on, Tiffany. My last one. Oh, there's one. Today is her birthday. Yes, we'll embarrass you good. Young lady is 13 today. Seventh grade. We're going to sing? No, 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 no. Let's stand out here and I want you guys to sing to just hit All right, we ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tiffany. Happy birthday to you. Thank you for that. Third day's a big birthday, and on a Sunday, once she's here, that's a big deal. Hey, you guys, y'all, have y'all ever wondered why we gather up here on Sunday mornings like this? No? Come on, y'all usually give me great answers. Why do we gather, do you think we gather up here for a reason or just random? Random? <laughs> well, one thing that happens is folks out there, and you probably know this, they just want to look at you. They want to look at you, they want to embarrass you, and sing you on your birthday, and do things like that. Now, that's their problem. But... There is a reason about it. I'm going to read about it. It's in uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's chapter 10. It begins with verse 13. It says, uh, Jesus blesses the little children. It said the people were bringing little children to him, who was Jesus, in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But Jesus saw this, and he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is, what? You have that book? You heard the story? I love you guys. Y'all are great. It said, Let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid hands on them, and blessed them. That's what Jesus did. So that's one of the reasons we gathered up here in the front. And so we all gather together and that you will hopefully receive a blessing. Now today, I've got a picture up on the screen. These are two young uh, kids, a boy and a girl that I met in Guatemala about four years ago. And I was sitting out on this grass eating lunch with them. And next week, leave me, I'm going to leave next Saturday and I get to go back to Guatemala. I don't think I'll see these two young kids, but I'm probably going to see a lot of the kids. We're going on a medical mission and we're going to treat adults and parents, or adults and children there. They're going to be working, with, I'm going to be working with dentists and doctors. So I'm excited to go. But what I would like to do is each week we get up here and we pray with one another. And I'm going to ask a favor. I'm going to sit right here and I would like you guys to come and lay hands on me. And we're going to pray together for my trip to Guatemala next week. Would y'all do that for me? Would? All right. Well, let's pray. Come here, guys. Y'all come and gather around. And y'all just put a hand on me or just on one another. And I'm going to pray. Lainey, you want to hold my hands? No? Drew won't. Drew won't. You won't. You will? All right. All right. Y'all pray after me. Say, thank you, God, that every day Jesus puts his hands on each of us, blesses our lives, and shows us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you. You little guys, Sunday school is ready. The teenagers, youth group, I think Katrina is sick today, so y'all get to stay for worship. Woo! We're going to continue our worship with some more praise and worship songs. So again, if you're able, please stand. Uh, join us in worship this morning. Let's just give it all to God and sing his praises.
Come to face to face with God and give thanks. With loud and joyful voices, praise him in song. Today, if he speaks, hear his voice.
another round of applause for Deb and her praise band. And I think all that they do, and you know, they're just like the rest of us. They're human and have been ill through the holidays and have had all kinds of different things going on. And their lives are busy just like the rest of us. So I want to thank them and our church thanks them for all they do and for all the musicians and people in our music ministry here at the church. We have a special treat for you here in a minute. We've got a uh, ensemble that's going to sing during our uh, offertory that uh, you may not have seen. You've seen some of them, may not have seen all of them, but pray that you'll enjoy that time of music and worship together also. If you would take out your slim insert, your bulletin, as we prepare for our pastoral prayer this morning, we want to go over some of our celebrations, our cares, and our concerns, and then after that we'll pass our baskets for our time of offering, and I pray that you will consider what you give to the church, what you give to others, what you give to your community. If you don't give or haven't given, or just as a reminder, we often ask that you give and find a dollar in your pocket. Find an extra dollar and just give that dollar. And when you do, remember that so many live on so little, that many live on less than a dollar a day. I think it's a good habit to have to just remember, regardless of how little we may have or how much, there's so many that live on so little. That's one I'll bring. Following that, I'll say that as I mentioned the children's message, I'm leaving next Saturday and going to Guatemala. And I really want to thank the church for all the items they have donated to me and for that ministry and that mission trip. I'll be back. I'll be gone two Sundays. But we're going there on a medical mission and uh, going to about 30 different people. I'm taking one group, another pastor taking another. I'm going to a small town of Kunin with a group of doctors and dentists on a medical mission where they will be treating kids. I will not be treating children and adults. I will simply be there as, as support, support staff. And this is part of uh, First United Methodist Church Fort Smith. Their senior pastor has been diagnosed with cancer, so he's been struggling this year, and their associate pastors are working very hard. So I'm going down there just for this mission trip to support them and be an extra, extra pastor on this trip. So I appreciate everything the church has done for me, continues to do the things that have been made and given to that trip. So I'm very blessed in that. We, uh, Today we have a coronation in the chancellor area on the altar that is in celebration of Paul Johnson's life. Paul passed away on February 3rd, and uh, we want to keep him, his family in our prayers, particularly his wife Gloria, who was at our first service. We also celebrated this morning the first service that Ivan Peschel, who uh, attends that service, gave a, a donation in honor of his 84th birthday to our children's ministry. So we celebrate that today. We also want to remember that Bella Vista Church of Christ is a family of faith that we are praying for this week. If we look at those that are in the hospital and hospice and rehab, we always have quite a few. This week and this morning, I'd ask, ask that we remember particularly Pat Potts, who was taken to Circle of Life Hospice Care uh, earlier, well, this end of last week or just a day or so ago. Remember Pat Potts and her family. They worship also at our 8 o'clock service, and some of them were here this morning, but they're attending to their mother who was passing away and they lost her. Mr. Potts just last year, same time, same time a year ago. So keep the Potts family in your prayers. Keep Shirley Davenport in your prayers. She's at Mercy Hospital. We thought she would be out, but had a little bit of complications, and she lost her husband just two weeks ago, a week ago. So we have a number of people that are suffering in our congregation, and we have those that continue to grieve for loved ones. I'm sure many of you have lost family or friends, but here in Belvis, it's something we deal with, and we pray that we deal with it well. Pray for and care for all those families who are struggling. If you have prayer concerns or joys that you want to share with us, please let us know. There's cards in the, uh, in the little things we pass around. There's some ways that you can put your name in prayer. I never remember that. Jan always tells me that I forget. But that's all right. Do write it down, though, because Sunday mornings are difficult for Brother Jamie and I. You can tell us something, and we may or may not remember. But if you write it down, we'll have it. We'll make sure your prayer concerns, your celebrations are or received by the church or whoever you want to uh, have those. If we would now, let's remember one another. Let's go to God in prayer. God, as we gather here to worship, we pray. We pray to you, our living God, in celebration and love, knowing that you are with us, praying that we will be faithful because we know that you are faithful to us. Lord, lift us up. Soothe our hearts. Wipe away our tears. Celebrate with us and love us. For all these things, Lord, we are thankful. We pray your blessings on a world that hurts. For those who are snowbound, for 
those of us that are simply tired, Lord, we pray your blessings for each and every one of us. And Lord, we know that you're aware of everything we need. But remind us to call for your help. To cry out in those times when we hurt. And to joyfully praise you in those times when we know that we have been faithful. And you've been faithful to us. Lord, we ask your blessings. We give you all the honor and glory this morning. Your most holy and precious name. Today we are concluding our sermon series called Searching for Significance. And it's been our hope that in the last few weeks, six weeks in all, that we've been working through our sermon series, that you have discovered that there is hope in our brothers and heritage. That's just a place for you. Right here on this poster, you know, Pastor Lee is the one who designed these posters. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but we do those here. Um, that's you. You are in the family line of Jesus. And over these times that we've been speaking, you know that we have continually reminded ourselves and thought again and be told that in no way is our Lord ever ashamed to be identified with us. And the person we're talking about today is the very first person that's mentioned in the lineage of Jesus, and that's Abraham. And in no way is our Lord ashamed to be identified with Abraham. 
Today we're going to be reading out of Genesis, the second chapter, uh, 22nd chapter, verses 1 through 12. We have many chapters and verses on the life of Abraham, but this is just one of those defining moments in David's life that led to a divine moment, that led to a deciding moment of faith. You can read about in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and the really there is listed persons of faith, and we call it, you know, for lack of a better word, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And you can read about David there. I mean, about Abraham there. Because he is the patriarch of our faith together. But he had a situation that occurred, an opportunity that God gave him. You may call it a test. And he had to think either with his head or his heart. Maybe he had to think with both. And so I invite you to, if you brought your Bible to follow along with me, as we read Genesis in the 26th chapter, and we'll read the, just the first 12 verses together. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Morah, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. And early the next morning, Abraham, he got up and he saddled his dog and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. And Abraham, he took the wood for the burnt offering. And he placed on his son Isaac, and, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, and he said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged wood on it. And he bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. And I want to remind you of what we read in Lamentations. And it says this in the third chapter of Lamentations 22 and 23. If you're a marker in your Bible, this is definitely a verse you mark or commit to memory. Because, the Lord, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, they're beginning in verse 2 of the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Concluding in verse 17, you and I, we read about the lineage of Jesus. And, and by now, you know that because we've talked about Every week. We've picked out people that are, are there mentioned, both women and men. And the verse 2, it begins, and it says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And there, from there, you just keep reading till you get to verse 17. And in verse 17, you conclude there by finally reading. Thus, there were 14 generations between in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Jesus Christ. So if you and I add up the 14, 14, and 14, then we've got 42 generations that are mentioned between Abraham and Jesus. That does not mean every generation is listed, but there, biblically, scripturally, there are 14 generations that are listed in there between Jesus and between Abraham. Abraham, though, is known as the patriarch. 
He's known as the Father. And, and you and I are listed as part of those that are blessed to be a blessing through Abraham's line. Now, thinking about the lineage and genealogy of Jesus and the patriarch of faith, I've thought about my own family. And, and you know, I, I can't go back 42 generations, can you? I mean, how, how many generations can you go back? For me, I can only go back six generations. From me to the earliest Alexander I'm aware of. And his name was Joseph J. Alexander, and he was born on January the 1st, 1816, in North Carolina. And his wife, her name was Freebrook. That's the closest to really hard biblical names we get. Now, after that, we get into a lot of Arkansas country names in my family, but Freebrook is spelled P H. E R B I A, Freebra. And she was born on October the 2nd, 1815, in North Carolina. And then they married. And oh gosh, what year was that? I have to check my notes. They just celebrated their wedding anniversary, y'all. Just on February the 7th, on Thursday, they celebrated their wedding anniversary. They married in 1839. And oh, gosh, they're still married. And, uh, and they were blessed to have several children and their fifth child was actually my great great grandfather his name was William Henry Alexander and he was born in, on May the 15th 1850 in Humphrey County Tennessee by then Alexander's had migrated from North Carolina to Tennessee and then they were to go on up to Kentucky but then Grandpa Alexander Alexander William Henry Alexander he was the first Alexander then that brought his family to Arkansas and he married my great grandmother, great great grandmother, and her name was Mary Ann or Molly Edwards Alexander. And the Edwards family beat the Alexanders here. They came to Arkansas and settled in Conway County in the 1850s, but they were married on November the 5th, 1872. And then they had a girl named Lula, and then they had a, a boy, and then they had a whole bunch of children after that. But that first son that they had was then my great grandfather. Marrying Cornelius Alexander, and he was born on um, March the 1st, 1876. And then he married my great grandmother, Mary Bullard Alexander, who was born on in, in September of 1890. She was his second wife. His first wife he had married, her name was Rosa Jeffrey. He and Rosa were only married for 10 years. They had a boy and three girls, and then Grandma Rosa died, and then he married my, my grandmother. They had three boys, and their oldest boy, Cecil, was my grandfather. And Grandpa Alexander, his birthday is his coming week. He was born on February the 12th, 1910. But he died in, 18, in 1963, only 52 years old when he died. And then my, he married my grandmother who just died, Evelyn Alexander, who was born April the 28th, 1913. And then she just died three weeks ago on Saturday. On January the 19th uh, of this year. And then they had my father, who's the second son, and he was born on April the 3rd, 1943. And then he married my mother, Jan Alexander, and she was born on April the 10th. We don't talk about the years, because I like to breathe, and I like to live, and I, I want to be here next Sunday to begin a whole new sermon series on the cast of characters. But let's just say, for her benefit, she's born in 1978. I was born in 65, but my mother was born in a lot later after me. And then um, they had me. And so, see, I can look at those generations, but that's it. And when you and I look at our biblical heritage, we can go through our own family genealogy and look at our biblical heritage. But our biblical heritage extends beyond the names we can name. My biblical heritage is like yours. It extends beyond Joseph J. Alexander, who was born in North Carolina on January the 1st, 1860. It goes all the way back to Abraham. And so when you and I look at Abraham, we're looking at one of our spiritual relatives. And today what we want to do is look at what can we learn from Abraham? What does Abraham have to teach us? Now, Abraham, Abraham's father was not mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, was Terah. And Terah was actually a descendant of Shem, who was the son of Noah. 
So see, here we even we can go back further from, from Noah to Shem all the way to Terah. And then Terah had his son, Abraham. But he also had two other boys. And then Abraham, we know, married Sarah. And Sarah and Abraham had a son named Isaac. But before they had a son named Isaac, um, they didn't think they would have any children. Remember, they were later in their years when they had Isaac. Abraham had had a child by a slave woman and had a son named Ishmael. Abraham was born in the Ur of Chaldees, and, and he traveled 500 miles from Ur to Haran, which is now modern-day Turkey. And he traveled there with his family. The Lord had, had invited him to be a part of what he was doing. He told Abraham that nations, that generations would be blessed through Abraham. He would be blessed to be a blessing and you and I are inheritors of that blessing. So he was there. And then his father Terah died. And God then called Abraham to move again. And Abraham picked up everything. And he moved 400 more miles. And it was there that he settled in the land of Canaan. And he lived there the rest of his life. And Abraham, we know, was successful and prosperous in his work life. He was a, he was a rancher. He was a shepherd, you know, dealt with agriculture. And Abraham was a man of faith. I mean, you and I, we could spend all day talking about great attributes of Abraham, but Abraham was human. He was flesh and blood like all of us. And just like all of us, he, he wasn't perfect. He didn't do everything right. In fact, Abraham's weaknesses were, he was impatient. I don't know if any of y'all have that weakness. Um, he battled fear at times. And when Abraham was under the pressure, you know what? He had a tendency to lie. We know that. Because when he feared for his life, he tried to pass off his wife, Sarah, as his sister. You know, I bet, boy, I bet he had a lot of roses to buy after that one. <laughs> well, one of the crucial lessons that you and I learn from Abraham, though, that benefits our life is that God can and will use us in spite of our weaknesses. Not only does Abraham teach us that as we look at the genealogy of Jesus, but all the persons listed in the genealogy of Jesus teach us that. But not only does Abraham teach us that God will use us in spite of our weaknesses, he also helps us to know that God will stand by and that God will rescue us when we do make mistakes. God will not forsake us, but he'll be there. Not only does Abraham teach us those two things, but the life of Abraham also teaches us that God is so greatly pleased by our faith and our willingness to follow and obey him. And we see that in Abraham's life. I mean, Abraham, like most of us do, had to come to a full realization of God's purpose and promise for his life over a period of time, it was a process of revelation. And God oftentimes works in process in which life lessons and spiritual gifts are really revealed to us. Nuggets, you know, that benefit our life. Now, God tested Abraham severely more than just one instance. Abraham was given opportunities to, to demonstrate extraordinary, extraordinary faith and and trust and obedience in, in following God that was given to him just as it is given to us. And there was no time, though, that Abraham demonstrated faith, a really a radical faith, and trust and obedience in God more than when God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And God asked him to do the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the unwanted sacrifice a son that he and Sarah were so I mean beyond thankful to have you know you can look back over your life and you can see moments where God was inviting you to um, really follow he, in some ways he was offering you opportunity to, to make a decision 
And when you look at those moments in your life, those are defining moments for you in which your faith is developed. Or you find out who you are. And you know what? Those are numerous times in our lives. Those are small occasions, and those are, are monumental events in our life that are defining moments of our faith. And here in Genesis 22, we, we read one of those defining moments in Abraham's life. And it happened right off the beginning when, when, Jesus, when God says to Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Morah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. I will tell you about it. That is a defining moment for Abraham. He had to think. Would he do this? He had to think with his head. He had to think with his heart. He had to think absolutely with both. God has asked him to do something. It's a defining moment. And would he do it? And for whose benefit would it be for Abraham's faith to be tested? Was it for his? Was it for Isaac's? Was it for God's? Who would benefit in this? You know what? I really believe that God knew the depth of Abraham's heart. He knew the depth of Abraham's faith and, and what he wanted for Abraham, what he desired for Abraham, is that Abraham would realize the extent, the depth, the magnitude of his faith in God because God knew that. And so what God does is God gives Abraham an opportunity. He gives him a moment to realize the purity of his faith in God so that Abraham would not doubt his faith. He would not forget his faith. He would not deny his faith in God. So that he could continue in this journey called life as a man of faith, of greater faith and greater determined faith. And so Abraham, he takes Isaac, and he goes on this three-day journey to the place that God would show him, to the place where God asked him to sacrifice his son, to take a knife, to sacrifice his beloved, God-given son. And without really ever fully knowing it or realizing it, Abraham must have had such a a solid, deep faith in God to do that. I mean, to go out to prepare for the sacrifice. And then somehow he knew deep within, even though God was asking him to do the unthinkable, that God would provide in the midst of it. I mean, did Abraham believe that the Lord would interrupt him? And stop him from sacrificing his son? I mean, did Abraham believe that he would actually kill Isaac and then God would bring him back to life? You know, that we don't know. We don't know Abraham's thoughts. But what we do know is that he had faith. And that was a defining moment for Abraham. And ultimately, in our biblical heritage and in our own lives, it becomes a defining moment for us too. And any time you and I have a defining moment in our lives, we're able to see each defining moment as a divine moment in which we have an encounter with God, in which God reveals something to us because that moment is drawing us closer to the Lord, drawing us closer in faith. You know, some people may interpret the testing of Abraham is God tempting Abraham. But to tempt someone is to entice them to do something that's not right. It's, it's to entice them to do something that's wrong. And God never tempts. The enemy, evil tempts us, sin tempts us, but God never tempts. And in, in the book of James, we read this. It says in James, the first chapter, verses 13 and 14, when tempted, no one should say, 
God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does the, he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. See, God doesn't tempt. He gives us opportunities to really discover the depth of our faith. He doesn't allow, I mean, he does not. He does allow opportunity, opportunities in our life for us to see where our faith is, for us to prove our faith. He doesn't do anything to harm. And he does this, ultimately, provides us these opportunities to really make us aware, to wake us up, to help us to grow. You know, why does he test our faith? Well, that question is answered also in the book of James in the first chapter and verse 3 where it says, Because we know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's not a one of us here that likes that word perseverance, right? We don't like it. We certainly don't like it when we're having to persevere through. But when we get on the other side, we discover that perseverance is a, it's really incredible. It's given to us. It means that we have the ability to last, to survive, to continue, to make it, and we do that with <coughs> faith. See, our faith needs to be strong so that you and I are able to, to make it to the end of this journey. To finish this race in faith. So along the way we have these opportunities. We have these defining moments that draw us to a divine moment. Where you and I have a divine faith that is realized. We may be called to, to some kind of divine task as Abraham was. But ultimately, we are called to a deciding moment. Defining moment leads to a divine moment that leads to a deciding moment where you and I have to choose. Will we trust God? We will remain faithful to the one who is faithful. We will believe that he will provide what we need, that what we read in Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23 is true, that his mercies are new every morning. The greatest faithfulness of our life. And that involves trust. And that's what we discover in those deciding moments. And there's not a one of us. That God has not created, loved, and called us by name. That he does not provide us deciding moments where we can just choose to follow him. So at all times, you and I as Christian believers, we have to think with our head. We have to think with our heart. We have to think with both. And when we look at the life of our ancestor, our patriarch of our faith, Abraham, he teaches us that. And ultimately, he helps us find our hope through our biblical heritage. Lord, we thank you today that you provide us moments they're defining moments, that are divine <coughs> moments, that are deciding moments. Follow you. And that you provide opportunities in our lives so that we, we can really have checkpoints of where our faith is and how it's grown and how it's developed and how we are faithfully trusting you. Some of those checkpoints we don't like. But we thank you that ultimately we discover something about ourselves that is good. As we discover your, your love and your mercy and your grace for our lives. But Father, we ask you to continually reveal to us that in no way are you ever ashamed to be identified with us even when we have weak faith. We ask you to strengthen our faith everywhere so that, like Abraham, we will be your children. It is in the wonderful name of your Son, 
who came in faith to provide for us salvation. May we offer hearts to your grace and to every sin. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we close in song, if you feel like part of this church family, we'd love to receive you here in membership. If you're invited to come on transfer of membership from another church family, if you're invited to come on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord of your life. Everybody to come. The four of me here is kind of a picture of my family. And I think what I've discovered in, in my family line is that five generations are common. This is Molly Edwards, I lived under my great great grandmother. And from her, there's five generations. From my own grandmother, Elder Alexander Evelyn, there were five generations. On my mother's side of the family, there's five generations. And me and the Alexanders that I've learned about are all in this picture. In Arkansas. And see, when you look at your family line and then you look at the family lineage of Jesus, you and I discover so many things. And those are great blessings. And today we've discovered that through Abraham, you and I were blessed to be a blessing. I invite you to stand and sing. I invite you to come as you feel that.
and live, they live to prove it and sat and kill them. So we're, we're glad to welcome them here on transfer of membership from another United Methodist Church. And I ask you this one simple question. We uphold this church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. But you know what? Last week we had pizza with a pastor for new members and visitors, and they helped cook the pizza. <laughs> That's how we like it around here. We're, we're glad y'all are here. And they're going to be here. And their little girl, Madeira, she's downstairs. Kind of, they adopted her. And she's a beautiful girl. And, uh, so you'll, you'll love getting to know her. But we're glad you're here. We're really glad you're here. And um, hopefully you don't mind me hugging on your wife. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but y'all come forward and welcome them here. And go forward to the knowledge our God is faithful. He's faithful in our past. He's faithful for us present. And he's faithful in our future. And remember, don't just come to church, but be the church. I want to ask you one other question. Pastor Lee left, but we'll tell him this. If you will commit to praying for him over the next couple of weeks as he prepares to go to Guatemala and while he's in Guatemala and for that, the mission team that he'll be a part of, will you say, I will? I will. Thank you for that. And have a great and wonderful week. Come up here and bless songs. Love on the Rock. Thank you.